What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to another edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand-Up here on this gorgeous Wednesday, February 7th, 2024. Here are today's top headlines. First up, Biden makes coal great again as experts soar to India. Next up, why Americans don't want electric vehicles. We've got a few reasons, but we'll see what this one says. Next up, facing demand increase, Duke Energy seeks to delay its 2030 climate target in North Carolina. Last in our news segment, more questions than answers after Massachusetts orders to transition from natural gas. Stu will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what's going on in the oil and gas finance market today. We saw BP drop earnings after the market actually beating their quarterly profit estimates and rolling out a dividend. So we saw that stock increase. We'll also touch on crude oil prices and the API um, crude oil inventory numbers give us a forecast of what you guys might see today. And we also got the latest short-term energy outlook, specifically focusing on natural gas. So we will cover all of that in a bag of chips, guys. But in person for the first time, g- 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 give, me a, give me a pound here. Yeah. I'm Michael Tanner. We've got Stuart Turley here. Let's kick us off. Hey, let's get rolling here. Uh, my buddy Biden, Diaper Dan, as I affectionately call him. <laughs> uh, let's head over to Biden make coal again. Great. And my. So when we sit back and kind of go, um, it's actually pretty funny. U.S. thermal coal exporters recorded more than $5 billion in overseas sales in 2023. Shipping over, Michael, are you ready for this? Mm -hmm. 32 million metric tons of the high-polluting power fuel, according to Reuters. (laughs) As the title says, make coal great again. Make coal great again. You know, the funny thing is they're shutting down the coal plants China and India are bringing them up. Mm-hmm. China has more than 400 in production and another 600 approved. Well, this is one of our, our favorite sources, Reuters. There's a quote in here. India is expected to remain a keen buyer of international coal as the domestic reserves are being depleted and power firms rely on coal. Forget this, 75% of the electricity. <laughs> They're not going anywhere. No, in, in fact, uh, India is be- beefing up their uh, cars, the, the EV cars that they're bringing in from China. So it's really pretty funny that India is becoming the number one destination. Here's the coking coal. Here's why they're doing that. We are m- moving manufacturing from China to India so they can import our coal to make the pollution in India more. This is making my head hurt. Well, don't worry. Apple's moving its operations from China to India. So so they're going to be using that coal as well. That's the funny part is that you've got everybody now switching from China to India. Just as India becomes more reliant on all these quote unquote killer fossil fuels that everything's going on. Oh, it, it's unbelievable. I Again, uh, they're, they're, uh, the Indian leaders are doing the best they can to elevate their their economy and their people and eliminate energy poverty. But Hey, Michael, let's go to the next one. Why Americans don't want electric vehicles. Why do you think that just give me your first opinion on this? Well, because I saw a tweet the other day from, uh, I I won't call the guy out, but his name, um, he's, he's a prominent, he's a prominent energy, like renewable energies guy on Twitter. Right. And he tweeted out something of the effect of, my app won't work, so I can't get into my Tesla. No way. Yep. <laughs> the app wasn't syncing with it. So why don't I like EVs? Too electronic. I like. I got my four wheel drive on a block. I don't need the government driving me to no. right to the right to the the police station when I make a wrong turn. Uh, the government doesn't like me anyway, but we'll leave that alone. And that's maybe not EVs as much as it is the electronic car part. I think right. the problem with EVs is especially like the cold. Maybe in a hot weather environment, it works. Right. Think about that cold streak we just had. Oh, uh, and they don't. Here's where the number one thing was. uh, Fewer drivers are interested in driving electric vehicles. Uh, Hertz, uh, according to a new survey, this is further confirmed by Hertz's recent announcement to sell 20,000 electric cars in its fleet. We'll be able to Uh, get them cheap. Oh, no, I would. But you got to buy a new battery for Mm -hmm. $20,000. Now, here's the thing. Uh, The zero, uh, the number one issue is the charging stations. Yep. 
charging stations are a failure. Um, and then the zero emissions label is misleading. This is coming up into a whole energy thread that we have is that the numbers for the green energy yesterday on our podcast, we talked about the UK and how they are misleading uh, the electricity. electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, the green, I've interviewed several uh, big people on uh, green energy and how climate crisis is being misreported. Mm -hmm. That's coming out here as well, too. So um, when you sit back and take a look, who can afford, Michael, the tax incentives? The rich. Mm -hmm. You think the poor people will ever care about a tax incentive? <laughs> Absolutely, because no. they don't have enough free capital to spend. No. Unfortunately, there are some. I know this comes as a shock to some people, but there there are some people in the world that just have to buy what's around them because it's cheap, and they don't have that much money. We don't just have all this oh. excess money to have a political stance around. No, and I, I just felt so, so sorry for all the folks in Chicago that had to wait eight hours to charge their car. Now. Uh, on a side note, I'm about ready to go to the next story, Michael, but Toyota um, is leading the charge on their um, hybrids. You and I have been talking about hybrid hybrids for over two years. Yep. And I'm all in on having a hybrid car and getting another two, Ford 250. Mm -hmm. No, uh, not a Ford. Oh, yeah. Uh, I want a 250. Hybrids are definitely the most, the best of both worlds. I'm all for battery backup on houses, especially when you have, when the grid is in such crazy condition like right. we're in. You know, this is, this is a, uh, uh, not an opinion piece, but more of a research paper. Jason Isaac, he's the founder and CEO of the American Energy Institute. Okay, yep. he recently was in front of Congress, the Senate or in the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. They heard they had a hearing on the federal electrical vehicle incentive that says is that basically what their what, what their research showed is that every EV sold places a nearly fifty thousand dollar additional cost to taxpayers. And what? yes, and then you have uh, the tires. Tires are lasting yep. less than five thousand miles. Uh, why are the tires on EVs last? Why is that? My tire. I mean, my tires are bald right now, but they've lasted a while. Thirty thousand, forty thousand miles. It's because the weight, the oh, weight, and then the car parking lots are failing. You start putting in because uh, EV, uh, the weight on an EV is 14, 15 times more than a no normal car. You're right. They're much heavier. It's no, it's it, I mean, so, I'm not driving an EV. Trust me. No, but a hybrid gets you 60 miles per gallon. Oh, yeah. I'm so, all about the hybrid. I'm all in on the hybrid. Um, uh, all right. Uh, let's go to the next one here. Facing demand increase, Duke Energy seeks to delay its 2030 climate target in North Carolina. Uh, Michael, you know what my opinion is of Duke. Mm -hmm. I always think good management, good numbers in any company, and they've always uh, really uh, done quite well. Duke is, is trying to do all forms of energy. And they are now projecting to increase their uh, energy demand is really going up. They are trying to increase 12% increase in demand by 2038, mm -hmm. driven by two dozen economic de um, development in the Carolinas. Um, and some of those are server uh, issues. So... Uh, AI is going to be just huge. Mm -hmm. However, they're trying to load in more natural gas plants. I got to hand it to them. It's tripling down on the coal to gas transition, uh, saddling customers with rescue investments in new polluting power plants and failing to deliver clean energy. Future call for a state law was Will Scott Southwest Climate and Clean Energy Director for the Environmental Defense Fund in a prepared statement. He's not reading all of the tea leaves. But he, but they're retiring. They 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 stated if you read this article, they're they're moving up the retirement of coal and moving to natural gas, which should be celebrated by everybody because that's one of the that's the biggest way, the biggest reason emissions fell. 
It is the, because the, the transition the, from coal to natural gas. The EIA several years in a row said but, that was their biggest reason. But you've got the Regulatory Council for the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association, Justin, whatever his last name is, some Alafes doesn't know anything. Who knows what how to pronounce his last name? Right. The point is, he says the bad news is they're doing they're doing that transmission assets to interconnect new gas. He's an idiot. I'm sorry that. You can't, um, when you sit back and take a look, people who just are a religion are causing problems. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about physics and finances, and then let's get everybody on the road. I'm all in on Duke Energy. Yep. I'm I'm with the managers on this. They are doing what's right. Mm -hmm. um, and you just got to love uh, uh, family meetings with... Uh, people that don't like uh facts let's go to the next one here more questions than answers after massachusetts massachusetts uh, that's the oklahoma way to talk order uh to order transition from natural gas I i'm not sure how to even get into this one um they're beginning to chart their next steps following an order issued two months ago that said signaled the beginning of the end of natural gas in the state this is a quote, said Senator Michael Barrett. The order poses the questions, but doesn't answer them for the most part. Wow. Imagine that. It's opening statement in the huge uh, conversation Massachusetts needs to have uh, uh, about truly reducing the footprint in, in the gas system in the state. Um, it, it's just unbelievable. Um they're already on the track. Here's uh, Caitlin uh, P.L. Sloan, vice president for uh, Massachusetts at the Conservative Law Foundation. They are already on the track. Everything is going to be electrified, so it should be relatively aligned. Most of the changes are on the gas utilities where they have to reformat their business model to deal with this. These are regulatory uh, issues that they're putting in on methane and controls uh, on that. Says they even killed renewable natural gas. Like they, they, they don't even want, they, they yeah. want to push us to such an, uh, and they're going to end up, as you know, once this all shakes out, buying their intermittent gas from who? Your Russia. friend Putin. Putin. Right. Yeah. Hey. Hey. All this is helping Putin. So I'd, I'd say I had a fun segment. It's off to you now, dude. Yeah, but before we go ahead and dive into the finance section, guys, we'll go ahead and pay our bills here. As always, this podcast is brought to you by the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all of your energy news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job keeping that website up to speed. Everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy business. Check us out again online, energynewsbeat.com. Hit the description below this podcast. You can go ahead and see all the timestamps, all the links to the articles you want to go back and hear. Hear anything you can do that. Skip ahead to see how BP's earnings shook out. Feel free to do that. You can also hit us up, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. Um, it's our MVP that we're looking at for, for, for uh, um, our little data news combo product. So check that out. You can email the show, questions at energynewsbeat.com. When we look at the markets today, I mean, they, they were there was some positive news. Remember, we got a lot of earnings rolling out, specifically in the non-oil and gas side. We saw the S&P 500 fairly flat today, only up about a quarter of a percentage point. NASDAQ falls about a quarter of a percentage point. Um, dollar index stays fairly flat, only only down about a, a tenth of a percentage point. We did see Bitcoin rise to above $43,000, um, uh, currently trading $43,21. Markets are closed right now for oil, or, or markets have reopened, excuse me, for the night trading session. Here's we record this about 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. We're going to go ahead um, uh, and work that night session. 73.65 is the current trading price. That's up about a dollar uh, from where it was trading at earlier, mainly due to the reason that there what 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 seems to be um, a a a growing ceasefire consensus going on in the Gaza Strip. The the, the problem what the the problem is is we see prices rise in light of new 
ceasefire talks, something between me and you doesn't necessarily compute. And again, that's again why when you're reading something like Reuters, be mindful of the fact that they're just they're just taking the news of the day and trying to fit it in with what happened to oil prices when that may or may not be the case. I think the big thing that was influencing prices today was the fact that we saw the API come out. We were forecasted to see a, a 2.1 uh, million barrel build in the Strategic Petroleum Reserves, which will drop as you guys listen to this on Wednesday. They're forecasting only about a 500,000 barrel increase, which again, that's going to be, you know, uh, aggressive on prices. So we absolutely love that. I think the only other thing that we saw today, Stu, well, two things. First, EIA dropped their short-term uh, short-term energy outlook. Outlook. They go ahead and basically do this every single month. But if we don't mind, Andy, going ahead and throwing up this this, this chart here, um, this first uh, this first chart that they have, um, which is basically comparing um, West Texas intermediate crude oil prices confidence intervals. Okay, so you've got basically the current price. You know, they've got the Stu curve, which gets it above one hundred and twenty dollars. That's their top. One. They got the Tanner curve, which is the lower one, which says prices could end up somewhere in the the the, the, the sixty to forty dollar range. I don't know if I believe that per se, but really where they're showing prices is 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 a downward spike, and I think that's changing a little bit from the sentiment. If you go ahead and look at that that first image, I mean they've got prices holding fairly constant at that seventy five dollar mark, which I think is absolutely super fascinating, um, considering I think where a lot of other people believe prices to go. So if you if you're a uh, a believer in that forecast, which I am, and all of the deals that we're currently working with, we're underwriting at seventy five dollar oil, seventy dollar oil. So we're we're not being too aggressive. But I think it's interesting there. I think the other thing uh, to notice is that natural gas consumption um, uh, peaked at one hundred and eighteen BCF per day consumed in January, which is a new monthly record. Again, that was mainly driven by the renewable sector. We're converting a lot of battery power. But absolutely have to love it. Natural gas storage um, in uh, I basically had a withdrawal of about 920 BCF, which is the third most ever, which is interesting because we've seen prices come down. We're currently sitting about $2, uh, basically even for the spot price. Mainly what that means is the beginning of the month, we started with about 13% more natural gas storage than we did over the five-year average. And that's generally how things are covered in the natural gas markets. If you're above the five-year average, anything that brings you back down below that is going to see as positive. Anything that brings you up is going to see that. So um, you know, prices on the natural gas side were were depressed, um, but we did see Brent again last uh, last month, January, averaging about eighty dollars per barrel. I think the only other thing that I th I find interesting, Stu, um, is that BP did drop their earnings last night. They saw about a five percent bump in their their stock price, uh, posting a, a basically beating their earnings by about three billion dollars for the fourth quarter, and went ahead and decided to do another round of share buybacks. This was the first. Uh, Earnings call for newly appointed CEO. What's his name? Um, Murray Antiklos. You know, basically, this is a, and, you know, he was named the permanent CEO a few weeks ago after being named the interim CEO. You know, just a little side note Bernard Looney, the former CEO, got fired for uh, having a, um, uh, inappropriate relations with colleagues. Well, guess what? Don't worry. Uh, the, the new CEO, he's dating somebody at BP, but he's properly disclosed it. So no, d don't, don't look over here. Look over here. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll give it two years before that, the fallout on that. Um, but, but, but mainly what happened is, and, and, and while we did see, you know, the stock price rise by 5%, something I found interesting is that, you know, in the earnings call, uh, Anta Close did come out and say BP remains strong, uh, remains strongly committed to its strategy to attempt to reduce oil production by 25% from 2019 levels, um, basically to 2 million barrels per day, while still attempting to grow their renewables and low carbon carbons business. But in the other breath, he said that they could grow its oil output beyond its 3% target for 2022 to 2027. So he's talking out of both sides of his mouth here. Hey, we'd like to reduce, but we probably won't. It's going to increase probably by 3%. Um, as we drive towards, this is the quote, as we drive towards 2025, we are focused on simplifying the business. We will pragmatically, pragmatically adapt to what's happening in demand with society. We will go for the highest returns and the highest value projects. And we know that's probably not going to be solar. They did come out and say they are looking 
um, for partners specifically in their light source BP division and um, canceling their um, uh, wind offshore or their wind project with Equinor. Um, they've got 12 to 16 oil and gas projects that could potentially get uh, a FDI, which is a final investment decision um, over the next two years. You know, to give you guys an idea, um, profit was about three, um, excuse me, profits, um, excuse me, were about 2.99 billion, beating the forecast of 2.77 billion. That's still about half from where they were last year, mm-hmm. mainly due to the fact that really strong refinery profits. Remember, Exxon and BP have really strong refining businesses which as prices rise you almost get a premium for those refined products so we absolutely love that um you know both exxon and chevron last year did beat their profit expectations uh, mainly due to the back of higher oil and gas production bp went ahead and said they're going to maintain their dividend of seven cents per share and increase the rate of stock buybacks to 1.5 billion dollars over the next three months which is up excuse me 1.75 billion which is up from 1.5 billion on the previous three so market reacted fairly positive for that they generated about 32 billion of cash last year compared to 41 billion in 2022 they did release their net debt by about a billion dollars um but you know overall good good earnings for bp what i'm interested in Stu, is so they've got a new ceo now but it doesn't seem like they're too terribly interested in changing strategy this is going to continue to bite them in the bahancas as they move forward this was an opportunity i think for them to shift strategies and get back into the oil and get back to what's really making the money, which is their refining business and their oil and gas business. Right. They've said some tea leaves about, oh, we're going to bring in a partner for light source. Hey, we're canceling this project with Equinor, but they still want to reduce their oil output by over 25%. Now, as they yeah. said, they're not going to do that, but I'm interested in where you think BP's going. In the toilet. And, and when you take, take a look at uh, Chevron and Exxon and Oxy, uh, they're not uh, total uh, total energy as we uh, call it on the show is actually moving uh, more along yep. the lines of the U.S. and their drill baby drill and they are also doing it again. Saudi Arabia has the mold broken. Yep. They are using their profits to pay for their hydrogen. For their renewable, they're doing it right. And the U.S., I got to hand it to Oxy. I mean, Oxy's doing it right. The The next big thing is the carbon capture and the carbon taxes. Oxy is leading the charge on that. No, I, what I'm wondering is, you know, there. I would say pre-COVID, you know, there was a big push to like, will BP officially divest BPX. Remember, their U.S. Right. onshore unit is a subsidiary that they fully own. It's not floated on the stock market or whatever. There was talks that it may or may not, they may sell that business completely. Right. Now, I don't think they do. No, the, uh, because uh, Total Energy uh, bought uh, enough gas-powered plants two months ago, three months ago, uh, in Texas, uh, that are equivalent to two nuclear reactors. So there are oil companies buying energy projects in the U S from the majors around the world. Yep. Absolutely guys. Yeah, well, let, let me uh, throw this at you here. Uh, we just had this article about Duke energy saying that in Duke energy, the demand is going to increase in the next year, year and a half, 12%. I'm looking at the article that we had earlier. Oh, the short-term on, energy outlook? On the short-term energy outlook. And when you take a look at the uh, natural gas is going to go up next year and the following year to 42% of our um, electrical generation is natural gas. And then it's going to downsize to 41 in a few years. Coal is going to keep going down 20, 17, 15, and then 14. They're just going to be keep closing those coal plants mm-hmm. down. Nuclear, 19, 19, 19, 19. They're not increasing our nuclear capacity. Renewables, this is where I think that they're wrong on their numbers. 21, 22, 24, 26 percent of our uh, electrical generation will be done by renewables. And what's crazy is that's not a big forecast jump. That's only 
five, 6% a year, which to do all of the crazy transition stuff that everyone's saying to go net zero by 2030, we'd have to do 20, 30, 40% cuts a year. And, and it's not, yeah, I don't even believe it. No, the, the numbers are not there, but listen, here's where the second order of magnitude of this report okay. kicks in is the CO2 emissions. Let's go through this real quick. Okay. okay so remember we had 12% increase, uh, but yet you're going to remain flat on natural gas and you're going to remain flat on yep. uh, nuclear and you're going to increase your renewables, which does not help your uh, elimination of CO2. Mm -hmm. So here's where this goes. Uh, it, it's uh, 400 and uh, 4,941 metric tons, million of metric tons this year, 4,700, uh, 4,783 million metric tons. And it's flat from here on out even though they're reducing coal, even though you're increasing renewables, you're not going to get any better unless you do more natural gas and more nuclear, and it ain't going to happen. Yep. We are going to flatline on reducing our uh, CO2 emissions. I think that it is actually hypocrisy in numbers is, is screaming out of their report. The EIA is taking a playbook out of the IEA. Maybe they borrowed some <laughs> borrowed some analysts. <laughs> Absolutely unbelievable. So, all right. Well, that about does it for us here, folks. What else should people be worried about? We're here down in Houston for NAEP. It's going to be awesome. Oh, we've got some uh, great events lined up. Uh, we are uh, communicating with the folks for the governor and uh, the governor of Oklahoma, governor of Texas. We have uh, three other uh, podcasts tomorrow. We're also working to try to get the inductees that are going to be there. Yep. We have uh, executives from Inveris. We have Doug Sandridge. Uh, he is uh, the executive director for the uh, oil and gas executives for nuclear. Um, we have uh, Sharon Muntz. She's with the uh, CEO of NCN uh, technology and AI and oil and gas. Uh, we have Jay Young will be over in mm -hmm. the booth. It is a phenomenal lineup. We've got Well uh, Database, Pecos Country Operating, and, and, and W Energy. We've got CEOs out the wazoo going to be at our booth. We got wazoo the, the CEO. Uh, that almost sounds like something you'd order at um, Chipotle or something. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. We're having fun, though. Thank you all very much. No, it's going to be awesome, guys. We'll appreciate everybody checking us out. We will be back. Back here on Thursday, uh, back here tomorrow for our final show, and then you'll be able to hear our weekly recap. But for Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.